So, I don't know. Just everybody uh, be nice to each other. Now, back to shitting on Taylor Swift. <laughs> Brunch! Hit it, boys! present sucks dawson oh why does the present suck because taylor swift ruined tiny desk concerts <laughs> I, I don't know if i want to say that she ruined tiny desk concerts but she had a bad one i'm not gonna feel the same way watching tiny desk concerts ever again and i was ex- i was super excited for taylor swift to do a tiny desk concert why because i think i i find it noble that taylor swift of her own doing, and because she's so great, has like ascended into this area where nobody else exists. And the only way that people are on are in the Taylor Swift world is if she like brings them along for a photo shoot or invites them on tour. And that that's how like you get any sort of Taylor Swift level, Taylor Swift squad, whatever. You've got all these bands. You got indie bands. You got major label bands. You got headliners. You got openers. All these things. And Taylor Swift is just so separate from all that because she's like, she's like, Lord, forgive me. This is absolutely incorrect. But like, she's, she's like Obama. She's just like, <laughs> she's like this different stratosphere of human, you know, where, where they're just seen in this totally different, yeah. different level than anybody else. And it's not because Taylor Swift's better than any of these people or whatever, but well, I, I, Taylor Swift is like this insanely popular insanely huge like even if she doesn't do something great it's just gonna get consumed and i feel that pretty much every other artist can't relate to that yeah i guess and i guess it's sort of a situation too where it's like taylor's so big and has so many stands that for her to do something or for her to to be on something sort of validates it in a way even if like a lot of us have known about tiny desk for yeah. a long, long time, and yeah. we've loved it for a long, long time. Not to brag. You've right. caught a few in my We're, day. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually not, like, the biggest Tiny Desk listener, but I knew that it existed. I knew that it was a cool thing that a lot of people enjoyed. I'm sure that there were a ton of Taylor Swift stands that weren't totally aware of Tiny Desk, and now they know it, and now, like, they're going to be Tiny Desk people. That's, that's what I hope, and that's what I always say when people are like, Taylor Swift sucks. I'm like, well, you can think that all you want, but she's very important. Right, because and it's what like, she does is going to inform how a lot exactly. of people and that's consume like, stuff. And that's like when she did the when she did um, uh, what's a, what's that song? The uh, LGD, LGBTQ. Oh, you need to calm you down. You need to calm yeah. down. Like she did that, and she was very late on like the like on this on being supportive and inclusive. Yeah, and people were were criticizing her. Like, like where oh, was she's, this? Yeah, right, exactly. But it's but, also like cash that check, baby. Right. Like, yeah, and, and by, not, not her Taylor to, cash check. I'm saying like LGBTQ community. Like, right. Hey, like. You, you, for for sure, use somebody huge that's and, furthering your message, right? And we talked about this like when when it came out that like I can understand why people were mad because you know obviously if you're in that group, uh, it would be annoying for her to be quiet for so long. Where and and now it kind of feels like she's she's cashing in on how popular like that movement oh, is definitely. becoming. But I also think that it's a situation where like she's also spreading that message to a bunch of young people yeah it can, who are it can going be mutually to... beneficial right exactly so yeah that's kind of how i feel about her, her being on tiny desk where it's like kind of validating tiny desk well, to a I, lot so of i liked that she wanted to do tiny desk and i liked that i still don't know this but she seemingly i've been told I'm, i misunderstood this but that doesn't sound like me <laughs> uh it seems like she wants to do like the festival circuit right She's like making her own festival circuit, I so think, she's, right? So she's playing shows on the West Coast and the East Coast. And then I think, didn't she say, like, I want to play festivals and where there aren't, where there aren't festivals or where there aren't things that, could, that I could fit into my schedule, I made them. And that's yeah. why she's got the Loverfest uh, that's what Massachusetts I thought. and Loverfest California. Yeah. And then in the mean, but it, she's doing other festivals. Right. So yeah, that's yeah. going to fill in the, like, she's doing that outside of, I don't know, whether it's like Glastonbury or whatever. Like, she, I, I would, I think she wants to play festivals, which I think is really cool because that, to me, is a sign that, like, hey, yes, I'm this, like, untouchable giant, but ultimately, I'm a musician, right. and I want to do what musicians do, and maybe the Taylor Swift stardom has gotten so big 
that that I've had to lose that a little along the way because what am I going to do? What am I? Am, am I not going to make my crew all this money right. by playing? It feels like not an entirely selfish and, decision, right? Like so, she she hasn't been able to to do things like that. And honestly, her live show has become so much of a production that I bet Taylor, if you got her on Truth Serum, would tell you like, man, I have I haven't had to like worry about my voice or think like, how did I play tonight? in forever because everything is so pretty much automated and everything is perfectly choreographed and everything is perfectly mixed that really while i'm sure it's very stressful musically she's not had to um to endure like much, much heavy lifting yeah. yeah and i'm sure as a as a musician and a good one she's probably like you know what i can play these festivals like everybody i can go out there and and like m- maybe not have the 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 best like yeah. mix or anything like that and I, I can just go out and do it so I appreciate that that Same. she's doing that it makes me like her more as an artist and also like I just mentioned that she introduces things to to her fans yeah. I also like the idea of Taylor Swift being introduced to people who might not otherwise be Taylor Swift fans right who are like you know what, we'll check out the Taylor Swift set. exactly when you're at a festival and she puts on an unbelievable show. And I'm sure that like during her course of touring these festivals, there are going to be people who go see Taylor Swift live who definitely wouldn't uh, motivate themselves to do it otherwise outside of a festival. And they're going to come away being like, damn, that was pretty cool. We, I promise we will get to the... I, I'm not, I, don't make no pro, I make no promises. We don't necessarily get back to things. We will get to the, t- the time desk thing. But on Taylor and the possibility of her playing festivals, and I really hope that... Like I did misunderstand this, and that she's not playing I'm, festivals, and we I'm, have this I'm, like big jumping off point. I'm looking at the tour there. dates, 2020. There are uh, there's a lot of like international festivals here. What like what? Uh, Festival de Nemes in France, Opener Festival in Poland, Ro- Rosk Ro Rock Ros- Guild, yeah, yeah, in Denmark. I think that's what's called Oslo yeah. Summertid uh, yeah. in Norway, the Waldboon in Germany. The work, but like rock skilled or whatever is uh, that. That's a that's a huge one. Yeah, and there's one in Portugal, another one in Brazil. Then she's got uh, two in L.A., which I'm pretty sure that's Loverfest, right? And then two in Foxborough, which is like definitely a Loverfest. But say she does. Let's so let's see when these dates are. I don't know. So say she does. Oh, interesting. What? So here uh, in J- July 31st in Foxborough. Uh, it's labeled as Taylor Swift Lover Loverfest East. Yeah, uh, and August first, the next day, is just labeled Taylor Swift. So Ooh, there may be only it's one the after show. <laughs> yeah, there only there may only be one uh, Loverfest sort of deal in Foxborough. Well, let's hope that the Loverfest lineup is filled out with better guests that than fucking Walk the Moon. What, what did, we, did we get? We didn't get Walk the Moon, did we? We no. got uh, the 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 thing that sounds like New Kids on the Block, but isn't. It's two people. They're like two K- people it's that like one hit. K O T B. It's like Kids oh, on the Block yes. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The, that is, it's such NSFW content. But did the podcast exist when we went to to uh, nineteen eighty nine tour? I believe so. Maybe I would think so. Yeah. Right, but man, we were. So excited for like the who they're going to bring out. It was when Waitress was uh, in Boston. So we're like, hey, it's a chance it's going to be Borellis. Like, I, I think, yeah, Brave was already out at that time. Like, there, there was just the possibilities were endless. And she's like, I'm so excited. To she bring was bringing out, out heavy hitters all over the place, like crazy. everywhere. They're Actually, like Ed Sheeran. I think the previous night was Walk the Moon. Okay, which and th- th- those guys are clowns, but like <laughs> better than hey, K. Do- those guys Do- were charting. <laughs> those guys, those guys were better were than KB No Swag, throwing out some some hits. Uh, so she's like, I, I'm very excited to bring out these uh, these these two artists or the, the, this next uh, this next guest. The, these are two incredible musicians, and we we were recording it because basically all we cared about at that festival or at that concert was seeing Heim and luring dads, Swift dads, yeah. to come hang out with us. I hope we did talk about this because man, that was a t- that was like one of the best days of my life. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that we did three but- dudes intentionally three dudes. <laughs> With cornhole set up and like a lot of four person activities, 
basically just like asking for it, it waiting, was, just like screaming, "We need a fourth. It was a tailgate Craigslist ad. And you know, we were cool. like looking for a dad. <laughs> and this was uh, this was before the bad guys took the flag. But we, uh, I, I have a canopy, so we set up a canopy and then uh, put up a uh, big American flag, like it was like country fest or some <laughs> shit like that. Nowadays, that's a did nobody take this the wrong way, but I, I you you feel weird putting up like a big American flag somewhere, and it's like, how did those guys get that? <laughs> right? They they took red hats and the red flag. hats and the American flag. That's <laughs> such a huge thing. Like I needed that. Like they've done a lot of bad shit, but man, they were they they nailed it on that one. And somehow they took uh, some really cool shit from us. Shout out! I think our buddy uh, Shane from houndmouth experiences i think i saw that on his uh ig story which uh is adorbs uh, sign me up i'm all in on shane from houndmouth's uh instagram page being like uh uh like a family instagram page now i don't know if i i followed him back yeah probably he had his he had his kid like a year ago or something like that but it's i'm a big fan of musicians and like rock musicians just having like wholesome af <laughs> instagram pages because they usually that's where that's where the, the goofy shit happens but anyway i think he he put up something recently that was saying like damn it i can't wear red hats anymore if it wasn't him it was somebody else one of the other musicians we uh we follow but anyway the potential issue with taylor swift playing festivals is something i've definitely experienced with uh with other like more top forty ish artists playing festivals, like you remember at Austin City Limits, we're just like trying to get from one stage to another. Yeah. But Sean Mendez is playing. Yeah, but so he Shawn takes Mendes, over the entire day. But that's because Sean Mendez played at like like five or six o'clock in the afternoon. There's absolutely no way that Taylor Swift is not playing last anywhere she goes. That's true. That so it won't be inconvenient. It'll right. just be a pain in the ass getting out. But that that'd be no different than if like Kendrick Lamar or somebody right. plays. Yeah, that's a good point. I was saying that to someone recently, though. Like, when you do drop in a Sean Mendez into what's like primarily like indie rock, it is not necessarily for people like us, but it's like adults are trying to do drugs. Right? Can you yeah. please it's, it's move like, with your children? Look at Lollapalooza when, uh, what's her name? Alessia played? Cara. Alessia Cara. Oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> that was another Twilight show where it's, it's like, like, we're getting into the party tonight. Like, we're already really drunk. We're yeah. going gonna to start getting real high soon yeah. and see clouds going up. And there are fucking 11-year-olds that everywhere. That was so funny. We were, quite, we were quite drunk at that point. And like you said, like... Half of the audience was children, and the other half was, like, potheads. Yeah. So as, like, buzzed dudes sitting in the back observing that, like, you got Alessia Carr, this great musician right. on stage, and I couldn't pay a <laughs> lick of attention. I'm just, like, watching, da- like, dads with, like, four-year-old girls on their shoulders, like, try, like <laughs> giving like mean looks. wafting away right. smoke as it mean punches their child in the face. To kids at a music festival smoking pot, and I'm like... <laughs> Dude, like, you I know, into like, this, right? Man. Like, you had to know on one unless hand, unless you're Kara or not, right? On one hand, it's like, it's it's like the best thing about music festivals. It's just like a bunch of different people living yeah. in harmony, vibing over the same things. Yeah, and on the other hand, it's like, ooh, this is child being uh, exposed to lots of secondhand smoke. Yeah. Do you? Uh, were you in line with me for water? You may not have been. Uh, when the kids behind either us or me started smoking a joint. I don't think so. I don't think I was there. It was awesome. I was such a lame adult. <laughs> the kids behind me started smoking a joint. And we talked about, like, festivals have generally become odorless other than yeah, BO because it's all vapes. And uh, as, as, as not much of a, uh, a pot smoker... In my day, I really don't have much of a uh, uh, a dog in the fight, but it was cool to turn around to like, I smell pot, <laughs> and it was like too. I don't know. It just like reminded me of like kids my age growing up. They were probably like in eighth or ninth grade or some shit like that. They they and they rolled a joint. I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Huey Lewis was on uh, my new favorite show, Time Crisis, and that's a cool. That's a 
cool situation to just have Huey Lewis in the house. It was a great interview. He drank a White Claw for the first time. He seemed like a really cool guy. But he was like lamenting. He was like, he, he was just crushing vapes because he was saying like, everybody should know how to roll a joint. So I find that interesting. And kids, when they go to festivals, I guess won't uh, get too much pot smoke from all that. But yeah, I do, I do wonder how, how people will deal with like that influx of all because they're going to come early to like set up to get like set up at the stage before you know like if you really want to see an artist you go watch the the person who's playing that stage before which is generally like two sets before because that stage will be yeah. blank so you're going to have a bunch of I don't know, you're going to have a bunch of people like watching Glenn Danzig play or something and then <laughs> <laughs> who looks uh what do we say bloated Oh yeah, oh yeah, we talked about Danzig because <laughs> yeah, we saw Danzig. Yeah. We we're like, Ugh. Look, he looks very bloated, buddy, <laughs> swollen. <laughs> yes, he does. Somebody. The reason I said Danzig is because somebody uh, posted a picture of like a Halloween costume they did years past, where they were Glenn Danzig, and they just wore like super tight clothes <laughs> to make themselves look a little, uh, a little. You know what he, look, you know what he looks like? He he kind of looks like he's just been like trapped in a body of water for I mean, like the last couple of years. He looks like wait is is it the Danzig what's the so the Misfits logo is like that skeleton thing but there's a there's a logo that's just like a face I can't think of it it's uh it's like a, a, a like a rock band's logo but it's like a fat face and uh that kind of looks like Glenn Danzig's face so shouts out to dude middle, if middle school DJ were listening to this podcast and he knew that every now and then, growing up Dave is touching on Danzig for a second. <laughs> he would be absolutely psyched. So, the tiny desk thing. Hold on. Before we get to tiny desk. Yeah. Not to delay it any further. 20 quick more minutes. Yes. Uh, the, I don't know about like the weed thing at Taylor Swift, though, because a lot of these festivals are European festivals. And there are just no... Fu- it just seems oh, like there's true. no was- fucking rules at, at European festivals. Yeah, the, the, the like, European half the people festivals, aren't wearing clothes. The kids are holding their dads <laughs> on their shoulders because they're all so drunk. <laughs> right. They're just drinking wine. <laughs> and then, like, the other one... The other one are in L.A. It's yeah. like... Uh, like, how, how much weirder can L.A. get? Yeah. So, maybe in Foxborough, like... Maybe that's the one opportunity for kids to be like, "What the hell is going on here?" But yeah. Again, well, that that, that one though, Dude, like it's a Taylor Swift concert it's not a music at Fox festival. at Foxboro. It's built around Taylor is Swift. a sanitary ass ster- like or it's sterile. It's like super duper white, like yeah. just sterile. Like, I don't know how that's even gonna it, work. It, I, I think that if somebody lit up a joint, it. And I, I've been to, to multiple Taylor Swift concerts at Foxborough. I've never once smelled pot there. No, me neither. Vapes or no vapes. I feel like you get kicked out. Like, I've never even smelled like the, the, the battery of a vape pen <laughs> at a Taylor Swift concert. I, uh, I, think, that, I think there's a good, a good chance if you light up at, at Taylor Swift Fest East that you might get kicked out. Also, in hindsight, huge mess up on our part in Hotlanta. We should have we like, smoked some, some of the, the devil's pot before... <laughs> The devil's marijuana before because we were so close. Uh, yeah, but that like, would have been such a cool experience. But how much more of a? How much would it have increased the experience? We already had the best times of our lives, just like absolutely ripping it up five rows from the front yeah. of the stage. Then we went out for for uh, breakfast. Yeah, at two in the morning afterwards. Have you ever watched a concert? D- don't specify. Uh, have Have you ever watched a concert like very high? Yes, I. I can't specify because I want to. I th- I, th- I I think I know a concert that you were. I think I, I know a concert that you were very high for. Father John Misty uh, in Maine. Yeah, uh, I've watched a concert like too high, and that sucks. At least for me, like I I don't really. Like, I've come to realize in my old age, like I don't like to be even like, a little more than buzzed. Zone. No, like I because I I I. I, I watch a concert obsessively with my right. undivided attention the way that i fucking stay up all night watching youtube concert videos so the i i think i'm over being i mean i've, well, I've it's a situation where it, like it's it's fine and it's in a situation where like you can do that the next weekend like you fuck up you get too drunk 
Yeah. And you like mess up uh, just like a regular everyday party. You're like, ah, eh, whatever. I'll get them next time. Right. When it's a show that you've been looking forward to for yeah. like a fucking year. Yeah. And you blow it and you black out like halfway through the show. You're like, oh, God fucking damn it. I've been there before. And it's like that sucks because you just ruined something that you've been waiting for for so long. Yeah. You wanted to like, like cherish. There are some concerts where I mean, I, I used to always black out at Sarah Burrell's concerts. Because I would, because my, my friends and I got so excited, excited yeah. for it, and we would, so we'd like all take off work and like start drinking at fucking like nine forty five in the morning and be like, we're singing Sarah Burrell's tonight, and then we get blackout and miss the show. Probably not dissimilar from people who tailgate for who are like yeah. season ticket holders to sporting teams that sell very uh, expensive tickets. And you just get bombed, yeah. and you miss the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, what, what's the point what, in that? Last time that happened to me, uh, I wasn't at the game, but uh, last year during the AFC Championship game, I got to Mexico on the day of, and we were like, oh, pool bar. We're going to watch football at the pool bar. And the yeah. Patriots-Chiefs had the Patriots -Chiefs game was the late game on the slate. So I watched uh, the Saints and Rams, and it was an unbelievable game, and we were just so happy to be in Mexico drinking at a pool bar that I blacked out in the second half of the Patriots. Chiefs game and it was like the best game right, ever. That's why I woke up the next morning and I watched the game on YouTube and I was like, "Holy fuck, I missed this!" Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, I don't know why I'm dancing around it. I think I'm like hashtag sober events game. I'm not. I mean, not, not sober, but like, like one or like get yourself one or a two light buzz, one or two so, something right because that that's also tough. I've definitely been uh, certainly as a as a younger man when you drink for a little bit before the show. And then once you start drinking, you're like, look, I don't care what my plans were. I'm, I'm having so much fun <laughs> drinking right now, and I just really right. want to keep drinking. And like suddenly you're like, get you're taking breaks during the concert when they're playing your favorite songs <laughs> to get more beer. Like it's more important to me that I add a, a Bud Light for nine dollars than to hear like a song that got me through some hard times <laughs> when the when the artist is like mere a feet away from me. But yeah, I think I think I'm trending towards the. Uh, I think I'm I'm trending towards the uh, the the more sober, more in control during during concerts, gang. But I'll yeah, just, it's interesting I'll, because it's like uh, the more the more unhappy I grow with my life as yeah. I get older, the smarter decisions I make to to not ruin my life. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I've uh, I, I hinted at this a while ago. I have cut back on drinking like crazy, and I, it'll, I'll I'll get it back. I'm sure, but. <laughs> It is. Uh, it's done wonders for my anxiety. Okay. Which, I, I did. It was one of those. Uh, it might be a placebo type thing, but uh, my anxiety was really, really terrible, and uh, I was drinking every night and like just really uh, leaning into it. Yeah, just like really like something's got to help me go to sleep type of stuff, and uh, then I just googled like. Can alcohol be bad for anxiety? And it was like, <laughs> can alcohol be bad for you? <laughs> yeah. And it was like, yeah, it can. I don't know. It's like case by case basis. So then I like went like cold turkey for like a month. And now very sparingly, like I'm, I'm going to a uh, basketball game tonight. I'll probably have a couple beers. But yeah, generally I'm not. Uh, that's probably the, the, the most like personal detail of my life I've ever shared. On this podcast, that, that's I, that, not that true. I've slightly cut back on drinking. <laughs> that's not true. We had the Bible episodes, uh, Bible episodes. Yeah, but was that so? That that was that was like that was like detailing. That a, was like Ellen saying she was gay. <laughs> when it was like, I, I, I think at that time, like it was commonly known that she was gay, and she just like said it right. like once and for all, and it was like a, a huge moment. So I'm gonna take that back. It wasn't like Alan saying it was gay because Alan saying she was gay or Alan saying she was gay was a uh, <laughs> was like a big important moment. This was I'm just saying this was like a confirming something that I'm pretty sure had <laughs> I kind of said a million different times. I'll also say this on uh, the Kyrie Irving thing. Yeah, that story came out and a lot of people are saying like, uh, is is Kyrie Irving mentally ill? Is he this? Is he that? And then, yeah, I wanted to get your. I actually yeah. like wanted to get your take on that because you you are very often the person who's like, "Hey, 
let's but, calm down on on making fun of this person. There could be real mental health issues yeah, at play. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't like that we pick and choose that. Uh, right. Who's okay? This to make person's. Fun of and, this person is uh, having a hard time. This person is. I'm going to use a cool buzzword. Inherently bad. <laughs> And uh, I don't think that's fair, and I think that certainly none of us are qualified. Like I, I, I don't. I I think that Kyrie Irving is a very moody, not a very moody, inconsiderate person, and that could come from a million different things. And I think just because he's, and that's what I ultimately think it is. Like I don't think this is like a wow, Kyrie Irving's deeply depressed and he's trying to get through something. I, I generally read it in my unbelievably unprofessional un uh uninformed opinion like it just seems like he's a jerk to people yeah but i'll say this the stuff about nets officials don't know what to do because sometimes he will just shut down and not talk to people at all and won't and won't do anything won't talk to people that it that there's like a big overlap between that or with that and people who are depressed like because that, yeah. that's something that like i identify with For like sure. crazy like i don't think that I don't think that I'm as overtly mean to but people. That's, but, but that also isn't like a, oh, he's for sure depressed. Right, he could right. just be an asshole. Right. And I, for, like, from my perspective, I, I understand like there are th- certain things where it's like, hey, maybe we shouldn't make fun of that person because there could be going through this, some shit. But I also think that it's very possible to recognize both sides of things. That you can say uh, this person uh, may legitimately be unwell. And I think I, I ran into that with like a lot of the Antonio Brown stuff. I was like, this guy might legitimately yeah. be unwell. Oh, clearly. And I hope that he can get help if that's the case. But he's acting like an asshole. Right. And I can call that out. So that's what you say. You say this person's being an asshole. It could be for a bunch of reasons. And it doesn't feel good to say this guy who's harmful as fuck and doing a lot of terrible things something's wrong with him and maybe in a perfect world he wouldn't have these things wrong with him and he'd be doing it better that said like someone like antonio brown isn't handling what's wrong with them the right way and unfortunately antonio brown has nobody in his life who's like hey man i care about you i want you to give me the phone and put the phone in my pocket tell me what's upsetting you Clearly, you're upset. Like, what's on your mind? Like, let's talk through this. So, I don't know. I, I j- you, you just said it, but I, I am not a fan of the uh, the picking and choosing of this person's this person's uh, not well, and this person's just a bad person. So, you, you never know what somebody's going through. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just found it interesting because the uh, the like kind of shutting down and not talking to anybody. I'm sure like. L- ladies, am I right? What was the, the the catchphrase that I tried to start? Am I, I right, ladies? Are, are you with me? Or are you with me, ladies? Are yeah, you yeah. are you like l- listeners? I'm I'm sure can definitely identify with like the when you're having like a really rough time. It can be it's ver- I would think very common to, to just like I'm not talking to anybody. Yeah. Even like the simplest thing, like a friend, uh, 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 whatever, can just be like, hey. Uh, how's it going with this? And you're like, I'm not going to say a word back to, to this. So I don't know. Just everybody uh, be nice to each other. Now back to shitting on Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, uh, with the, uh, with the tiny desk thing, ultimately my conclusion was she wants to do these things. She wants to do things like the other musicians, but she's too Taylor Swift. She's like so far Taylor Swift that she can't just do a tiny desk concert, which is, I think, like a, a shotgun mic in the corner of an NPR office. You walk in with either small band, play an unplugged set, acoustic set, whatever. The space is yours. Do with it what you what what you wish. But you've got limited resources, and it's a very small, intimate thing. Mm-hmm. Taylor Swift shows up with, and it's like ten to fifteen minutes long. Taylor Swift shows up with a crowd of. 310,000 little kids. And she walked in and she walks in and the first thing she says, "Wow, there's a lot of people here." Right. How yeah, like, how this yeah, happened? How, yeah, how did these people get here? How would you all get in here? 
and then unless over the like next everybody who works at NPR like brought their fucking kids because like well that is cool like they deal. want to see Taylor Swift and everything like, maybe so, that's what happened so record it and have them all <laughs> sit in a different room and watch it so it can be a small intimate thing right uh, anyway so she comes in and then over the next half hour she has costume changes she t- talks and talks and look you're not gonna I'm never one to judge a talker <laughs> God, but she not. talks the entire time. She plays four songs. Wait, she plays four songs? Yeah. No, no, no. She definitely does play four four in total. Yes. Tell me that's wrong. Yes. Uh, so I made it through like 15 minutes of the Tiny Desk concert. I didn't watch the whole thing because I watched it before you got here. And I think I was on the third song. And I was like, this is as far as I got. Sorry. You yeah. showed up. So I guess I only missed one song. Here is the pie chart breakdown of Taylor Swift's Tiny Desk concert. 80% talking 10 percent bad songs lord 10%? forgive me yeah this is gonna be Man. controversial Man. Uh, and 10 percent good songs okay the good songs were lover ah. and death by a thousand cuts Are you now the song is good or the, the performance perform- okay all right the performance again gets back to why this whole thing was very different and look different can be good and different can be bad this was different bad she plays it very dramatically and big, like she's on stage in front of 310,000 little kids, which I guess she just, like, she essentially just brought a stadium show and packed it in yeah. to the She tried NPR to get studio. as close to 310,000 as she could. Right. Stadiums hold 310,000 <laughs> yes. people. Uh, and she's just doing all the Taylor Swift-isms and all the big things, when in reality, like, I would love to hear... It like those voice memos on the 1989 deluxe thing yeah. where maybe she's she just sitting down with a guitar, playing the songs, and just like stripped down and again doing the doing the the things that she probably doesn't get to do musically because she's this huge big thing. And instead, she just did him yeah. like so, she would have like, anyway. My problem with it is just like, without dancers. The and, reason Tiny Desk is so great is because it's unlike some anything else that you see in music basically where it's just like it's something that is completely its own thing and artists usually go into it being like we're going to embrace this and we're going to do something that you wouldn't usually otherwise get to see from me or from us or my band oh, yeah. and taylor swift just turned it into an acoustic concert and like an intimate setting and that's all it was it i i didn't like it it was, and I also think that it, it's the setting that doesn't really work for for Taylor Swift, really. But it could if she it, just sat there. Yes, it could. She could, and she could have had a small band with her. Just have a little. Yeah. I mean, like you don't have to just be there by yourself. I mean, Diane Coffey. Uh, but the like, more you strip away from Anthony the, Hamilton, all these right, guys, but those are extremely talented people. <laughs> and I'm not saying that. Taylor what are you Swift, saying? I'm not saying that Taylor Swift isn't extremely talented, but I think that a lot of uh, where her talent is allocated lends towards bigger, Big, yes. bolder things. Right. She's so a the star. More, so the more you strip away from Taylor Swift, and the more like of like these big shiny parts you take away, the more average she is. Also, in, like she's so not a she, she she's played, not a fantastic songwriter. Mm-hmm. She's not a fantastic singer. She doesn't have an unbelievable voice. Right. She's a she's somebody who uses what she does have and turns it into like a big shiny like perfect thing yeah and you can't you can't do that in a tiny desk concert on the songwriting thing i will say i i do agree that she's not she's not an elite songwriter i'll always say though i know places who that is a songwriting clinic so she's she's got some she's got some some real great ones but uh and another thing, you said like the more you strip away, the more kind of ordinary it is. Perfect example. She played uh, All Too Well, which is one of which goes into the category of I would say like disposable Taylor Swift songs, like mm-hmm. the 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 very common chord progression, everything that you've kind of heard a million times. And when you just go and sit and bang that out on piano, it's it's nice and it's pleasant, but it's not like wow. Right. It's not really going to stun you. I think that she has enough songs throughout her catalog that she could have sat down and played some really cool renditions of songs. I, th- I thought that uh, "Death by a Thousand Cuts" was, was very good. That awesome. was the best one. And it, that song, what I heard, that song rules. Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, just wasn't for me. But I wonder if if she wants to do these things that other, that the other musicians get to do because they don't have this like I have to be carried around in a box because I'm such a huge celebrity thing, mm-hmm. which was proven to be untrue, despite some rumors that <laughs> Lambie was, by you <laughs> that, that Lambie was in there. No, there was a that you remember that news story? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Father John Misty helped to spread it by saying that Lambie was in there. Uh, but yeah, she 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 wants to do these things like all the other musicians get to do. But then ultimately, when she does them, she like does them as Taylor Swift. Right. So it just ends up being a I think worse, just, weirder version of it. She just can't escape the fact that she like is Taylor Swift, and she always has her brand and like her her image in mind. And like it's made her very successful, and I don't blame her for that at all. But she she goes into everything saying like. How can I make this Taylor Swift? Yeah. All right. Today's episode is brought to you by Porches. Fall is here, and what better time to install a new porch from Porches? With made-to-order designs to fit any budget, Porches will help you design your dream porch. Here's something I bet you didn't know. A porch with a fire pit not only makes your house the best on the block, it greatly adds to the overall value of your home. In just one day, Porches can install a brand new fire pit for your porch. Not interested in a fire pit? Porches can make you chairs, nice ones too, that'll go great on your porch. From handcrafted low-sitting wooden chairs to those plastic white ones you get at Home Depot, Porches has a chair for every occasion. Don't need a chair? Your funeral. Porches has a decent wind chime selection too. And if you're giving one as a gift, Porches wind chimes ship with a ton of paper wrapped around the tubes and clapper so it won't make any noise before they open it. No porch is complete without a couple of short glass tables where you can put plants. In addition to three sizes in stock, porches can custom make you a set of those short glass tables where you can put plants in colors ranging from wide me- white metal with a glass top to brown metal with a glass top and green metal with a glass top. Thinking of freshening up your existing porch? Porches has that plastic stuff that looks like wood but doesn't soak up water or splinter. Porches technicians will lay it down and drill it in just like they would with wood, but it'll serve as a more versatile and practical base for your porch. Skimped on the fire pit and fake wood? It's screen season. Limit the damage done by Mother Nature and stay a little bit warmer on your porch with a screen custom cut by porches. You'll still be able to sit on your porch and enjoy the fall nights with those tiny little wires blocking some of the cold from getting all the way inside your porch. With porches, you can always show your true colors. Porches has flagpoles and flagpole holders, so you'll always feel at home on your porch. A bathroom on your... (laughs) A bathroom... (laughs) A bathroom on your porch? It's been done before. Porches will visit your homes, <laughs> size up your porch, and see if maybe there's room. F- <laughs> for a toilet on that bad boy. <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll never have to run back into the house in the middle of a porch session again. <laughs> Especially if you also have a mini fridge that blends into the rest of your porch. Porches will custom install a mini fridge made from 100% plastic stuff that looks like wood, so you can always keep your favorite porch beverages cold. Halloween is come and gone, which means Porches is having its annual pumpkin overstock blowout. If you're looking to buy hundreds of pumpkins, Porches (laughs) Porches has tons of backstop and everything must go. Get a Porches Chain for Life membership and you'll get unlimited chains for holding up those swinging benches that are on por- <laughs> <laughs> that are on porches. The Chain for Life Club also includes unlimited hooks with screws on the other side that'll drill cleanly into both wood and the plastic stuff that looks like wood. Why do so many people take good care of things like their host- house and lawn while totally overlooking their porches? If you need a cool sign to put on your porch, Porches has a sign for every mood. Hang a sign on your porch that says... Home is where the porch is, or take your porch on the road with a My Other Car is a Porch bumper sticker. Planning an outdoor movie night? Porches offers pretty good projectors and screens that will let you watch your favorite movie or game right from your porch. Don't be a piece of shit with a bad porch. Trick out your porch with porches. Use promo code BRUNCH for unlimited tips on how to upgrade your porch today. Wow, thank you to our sponsor, uh, Porches. 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 I wouldn't hate one of those. I wouldn't kick one of those bumper stickers out of bed. No, definitely. Those sound like those sound like a, a real party trick. My other my other car is a porch. <laughs> yeah, Be, get make, it. Make people think that oh, you meant Porsche, dude. Porsche? No, I mean uh, I mean an actual porch. A porch. Boom. Porches. 
Faithful porches. Don't be a piece of shit without a love, porch. <laughs> love, love us some porches. I like that their projectors are only pretty good. Yeah. That's a, that's they that was the, the bar th- low. That's some honest copy they gave <laughs> yes. us. They gave yeah. us some some pretty honest uh, copy. Another reason uh, the present sucks is because wait, wait, is it? Let me see. Is two thir- What time? I never friggin' know. What time is twelve thirty PST American time? Is that three thirty or two thirty? Uh, twelve thirty PST. That's three thirty. Damn. All right. Well. Heim is putting out a single today, and uh, I have to depart before it comes out. So you're not getting Heim reaction, but the song has been described as a song about being in the thick of a depression, Ooh. and it's coming from Heim, and, so and check my boxes, Zaddy. Yeah, and described as like the most Heimy Heim song that ever Heimed. I love that. What do you think that means? I have no idea, because Heim, Heim is so many different things. Heim is a pretty chameleal, yes. that's not a word, but like now it is. band. They, not quite to the point of Bruno Mars, but... They really but shapeshift. They can play. Right. They can They've play been anything. Accused of being derivative of like a million of different things. Of every different band, right? Yeah. Which is a great compliment because it shows that they can play any sort of style. I'm very excited to have new Heim. I'll say this, and I, 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 I love Heim, but I don't. I don't. Stock is pretty low. No, it's, it's just the like, lowest it's ever been. I don't like the. And I know that it's got to come out sometime. But yeah. I don't like the big buildup in the three thirty, and I gotta wait for that sort of thing. I would love for Heim to just like drop, drop some stuff and say, "Here's a surprise drop," because my my week's been thrown off now. I'm yeah. waiting for stuff. Or I wouldn't hate if if uh, I'm, I'm assuming like their album just isn't done, maybe. But wow, shocker! Yeah, <laughs> but I'm starting to wonder if they have like uh, if they like uh, perfectionist paraly- paralysis. Oh, paralysis! paralysis? Yeah. yeah. I think that they might. Like, it would make a lot of sense. Because we've talked about before, like, there's never a moment in life that I don't envision Heim thinking about and making music. And totally. So, like, for... Their the- phones have to be overflowing with voice memos. Yes. And so, like, the fact that it takes so long for them to put out an album tells me that it's probably because, like, they just keep tweaking it and they keep, like, they keep trying to perfect it and they don't want to put out anything that they're not completely proud of. And that's that's super cool. I mean... Hell, like Heim was big before they even put out an album. Right. Like th- this yeah. has been going on since the dawn of time, where they're like they're making singles with Ludwig Göransson and Ariel Rekscheid, and still like not just dropping an album. I'm right. like, you guys are keeping some awesome company, <laughs> and you're great musicians with like the best pop sensibilities. It's gonna be good, right? Uh, yeah, but I, I I stand by the fact that I think that. Heim's stock is at its lowest, or the lowest that it's been in a long time. One because we haven't heard anything from them in a long in a while. Yeah, their last album was great. I loved it. Same, but I revisited uh, it this week. It's very cold uh, in, in the sense that I haven't heated it back up in a, in a while. Yeah, uh, and their last single there was no not very to good. Protect you to protect that, right. that cold from getting <laughs> exactly. in. Exactly. Those little aluminum wires uh, yeah. are, are not protecting me. But Nylon mesh? What are, they, what are screens made of? Right, we'll get some... We'll get a, one, a we'll porch's guess. technician on the horn. Yeah, we'll get... A, we'll get a next, guest, next guest on the show is a, a porch expert. Porch's technician. Yes. Um, but... Yeah, and the last one didn't do anything for me. It was yeah, so it was boring. Fine. It was just like... A, it was like an easy, breezy kind of song, which is cool. Toss that on the album. Right. But... but the big thing is that it was their first single in forever. So that's the thing. I don't know what, what singles are anymore. And people could push back on me when I say like, hey, that song isn't a good single. They're like, oh, it's not a single, DJ. It's a teaser track. What the I'm fuck? I'm like, man, I used Shut to up. know everything if about you, pop music. For me, what? I don't know what these words mean anymore. Me, I'm a dumbass. I'm a, I am completely, I will completely admit that I know like almost nothing about music. Did other the song than whether come out before the good, album? You're, it's a single. You're right. If, it, if it's released on its own, that is a single to me. Yeah. I wouldn't hate. Uh, I wouldn't hate if Heim did what Vampire Weekend did with Father of the Bride, which was like wasn't like six months before, but it was quite a while before. They just started putting out two songs at a time, and that was a double album that had like twenty songs, something like that. So they could afford like to do that. A and B, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I wouldn't hate if like Heim would do that. The the the, the massive massive build up to just like one song. 
I don't know yeah. if it if, if it works anymore. And they could do that really really well too because like again they have so many different styles that yeah. like you could put out a, a, like a, an A side that is completely different from a B side and have them work well together. So again, let's try to get to the bottom of what could the Heimiest Heim song mean because ultimately the, the song I think of what when is, I think of yeah, like I was the, the ask, Heimiest what is what is the Heimiest Heim song that already exists. You know what I think it is? What? Well, what's, what's your answer? Uh, mine would probably be Little of Your Love. Yeah. Really, really fun. Really yeah. infectious. That's probably the correct answer. Mine was going to be My Song 5. That one is like so fucking weird, though. Like, yeah. But it, I guess that it might make it the heimiest time song that ever existed. But it's... It's it, the most unique. It's yeah, so that doesn't that doesn't work for me as the Heimiest Heim right, song. Right, because Heim songs usually have unique. some sort of uh, feel right. or a nod to to somebody else. Man, though, I was listening to that to their second album last night. I forgot that that is a great album. It's fucking awesome. I forgot how much the title track rules. Something to tell you. Yeah, that song is great. And the the there's really like not a not a bad song on that album. Uh, as far as I, I can didn't remember. love, I didn't love "Found in Silence." That was a little, uh, that was a little throwaway for me. Yeah, it was like a, it was like yeah, a, I, don't, I can't even think about what that is. So maybe it was that's... the one that uh, was uh, very "Viva La Vida." Okay, it was like dut, 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 um, But man, all all the other songs. One of my favorite songs on that album. It actually, it could be my favorite song on the album. Is uh, is kept me crying. Okay, the one I did with Rostam. Yeah, that song rules and has a killer guitar solo at the end. And I just love when I love when Heim shows off. Sneakiest one for me is uh, is walking away. That's yes, yeah, so that, that's that. So I think I think Rostam also did that one. Okay. Which went like that guy. That guy rules, man. Th- like reminiscing on Heim and and like them putting out a fucking awesome album is is getting me tingly. This is well, you know what? We're going to like a high school reunion or like a some yeah. reunion in the night like, before. Well, you know, no, you know what we're doing right now? We're doing the night before a wedding. Oh yeah, we're like yeah. staying up and like remembering <laughs> yeah. shit and just talking about like, hey, remember this? Hey, remember this? Yeah, oh, yeah. I had that. Uh, I had that with uh, with with uh, Moo this week. I, oh, I yeah. like, rediscovered, re dove back into Moo. Yeah. And just like forgot how fucking good she is. Oh yeah. I mean, you put her and Diplo in a room. Yeah. And I tweeted walking it. Walking out with magic. And I tweeted it. Um and I think that it might have been discussed on the podcast before, but it if you had put all the songs that she released in between her two studio albums. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't love the last studio album. Like it it was largely forgettable yeah well her her first album was so amazing that yeah it was a bit of a drop off yeah but all the stuff that she released in between those two albums if you had put that into its own album it might be like one of the best pop albums of the last 10 years yeah there are so many bangers that she released in between those two albums and it, like that's not even including the collabs so like Moo is still super underappreciated, even though her uh, her last album wasn't that great. Yo, why don't I remember the song "You Never Knew"? I'm looking at the uh, the credits on something to tell you, and it says, "Yeah, I don't know." You never knew. So it says it was written by Dev Hines. I remember they did a song with Blood Orange, and that I loved it. What could I? What could it? Let's. let's... Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, this was this was a very. Uh, uh, Tango in the Night, uh, Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, it's a good song. Yeah, I don't really. I didn't really remember. I like if you would. Mm-hmm, shoulder mm-hmm, on my back, mm-hmm. and then there isn't. Is this is like a go slow thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, that was Heim with you never knew. <laughs> World premiere. Wikipedia says the writers on that one, Alana Heim, Danielle Heim, Esty Heim, Ariel Rekshide, and Dev Hines, better known as Blood Orange. Is, uh, is, how do you pronounce Alana's middle name? Is it Michael? What's, what, what's M-Y- Alana working with on the, uh, the old mid name? M-Y-C-H-A-L? Oh, maybe. 
I don't know. Hmm. I guess there's a lot about Heim we didn't know. Yeah. Forgotten about that song you never knew. That was the, oh yeah, the, I guess you never knew what was good for you. That was a good song. Hell yeah. So, there's going to be new Heim. Very excited to see what Heimy means. This is gonna, we're going to learn. There for we're going to sure. Yeah, we're going to learn though about what Heim thinks of themselves that they think that this song true. is very Heim. Cuz when I when I was pushing Heim on people back in the day, I would always I think I would always lead with if I could change your mind. Okay. That's not a bad one. Yeah, but that's more like en vogue Heim. Cuz there's like different You know what might be like a uh uh a really good Heimy Heim song is uh Don't Save Me. Yes. Yeah, that's a perfect one. Yeah. That's really good because like there's there's En Vogheim, there's Fleetwood Mackheim, there's Princeheim, there's all these different ones, but then there's there's just like a, an overall vibe that is cer- that that certainly the first album is cloaked in that's like this is just fucking Heim. Yeah. It's like cool ass beats and it just sounds like it just sounds like this like cool driving thing. And Don't Save Me is a perfect example. I was look man, looking at the track listing of days are gone look at this run to open up the album falling forever the wire if i could change your mind honey and i don't save me days are gone my so far really uh the the entire dead, album dead, no but dead serious it took me uh like when i first started getting in time yeah it took me i i would say at least a year to get to the back end of that album Really? I'm dead serious. Because it because, starts so because strong. Because I listened to like the first five or six songs of the album, and I loved all those songs so much that I never I never went forward. Like, I just kept listening to those same six songs over and over and over again. And then, like, eventually I was like, hey, maybe I should check out the back end of this album. Yeah, one of my favorite songs in that album is uh, Days Are Gone, one that Esty sings. Mm-hmm. And just like the ultimate Danielle Heim beat. So good. Yeah. Man, very, very excited for Heim. Good stuff. Uh, you didn't check out Jesus is King? Uh, I did. I checked out the first song, and I didn't make it past it. Ah, uh, yeah. The first song was, was quite not good. This, this, is like a, this is a negative music episode, which <laughs> is not, uh, not, 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 not my bag, but the, the first song on that album stunk. Yep. I liked the rest of it. I loved it. There, there was a song with uh, Clips, and Ooh. it's very fun to hear Pusha T rap on a gospel song because he goes in and he's like they're like hey uh pusha you got a verse and he's like "Ah, i got something in mind and they're like okay well just remember no cocaine stuff on this one and he's like ah ah Uh, yeah i'll be i'll be right back (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah pusha t rules he's he's so great one of my, fa- I, I, we talked about this at the time. I, I did not like that. Uh, a shot at Drake that he took. He said that he called Drake an Uber driver. Yep. Which I found disrespectful because like, I didn't like. Don't when people- occupation shame. Yes. I yeah. We we don't occupation shame uh, on this podcast. But it's just so random and weird <laughs> to like to make Uber driver a derogatory term. Push a T can make. He can make anything sound derogatory, and he can make anything sound like it's about cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> He could be like, very true. I operate in the fridge up above the cupboard. You're like, oh my god, like, he's yo, talking about a, so much. Get coke. a custom cut porch from porch, right? Yeah, you're, you're like, like, oh shit, oh my it, dude, it, it, like kids are listening, cocaine? right? Dude, watch them with the porches talk. Man, uh. this guy in the cocaine, he never has to be talking about cocaine, and it just sounds. Uh, man, he's he's so great. I love him. Uh, so th- that song is good. The song Closed on Sunday, I thought, is awesome. I Super thought Closed on weird. Sunday was the first one. No. Closed on Sunday is the one with the uh, the very corny lyric. Closed on Sunday, you're my Chick-fil-A. Yeah. That, I think that's the one that I heard. Isn't that the first song on the album? No. The first one is uh, something that sounds like... So we it's have. like way too fast. It's way too uh, well. There you go again, playing albums out of order. I knew I knew you, this would catch up to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So apparently, I didn't listen to the first song on the album. But you listened list- to Close on Sunday, and you thought it was Close bad. Close on Sunday, and I thought it was very bad. Yeah, Feidelberg and I uh, were uh, were disagreeing on that one. That's I thought oh, that was the best. That's the best song on the album. It's, well, I guess uh, I don't need just- to check out the album then, because if that's the best song on the album, I couldn't make it through it. Uh, I well, I think you need to hear other things in before context. you hear that like 
Sort of like the Taylor Swift. Uh, it's like super uh, minor forward, and whatever. super not Kanye West. So when you're listening to Kanye trying to do gospel stuff, and then you get to that, you're like, this is cool. What's the What's been like the general reaction to the album? I I, I think Kanye's in a weird place where people uh, people aren't necessarily looking forward to saying that something from Kanye is good, but I uh, JF and I were uh, talking a. a, a about this like it's it's like a i'm gonna keep listening to it album like i think it's good and i enjoy it and it'll be an album that i continue to listen to i don't think it's his best but i didn't think it was going to be his best i don't think it's like i don't think it's really uh deserving of major criticism or really making making fun of it that's the first song is terrible and it's it sounds like somebody who's never done and written gospel music before trying to do it for the first time and it's it's a little rough around the edges but whatever credit to kanye doing trying to 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 push boundaries and be outside the box and currently like god is super important to him so i like that he's doing that okay all right do i should i uh, just like give up on hope that kanye will ever be as good as like he used to be probably yes Yeah. yeah he was the best no, I know, but like he's not even close to that anymore. I know it's upsetting, but I mean, he was like legitimately people. I mean, I I didn't love Jesus. I I, I, Jesus I, I find all. it I find it funny also. Like th- that's some growth that he's both put out an album called Jesus and Jesus is King. Like this is like a monumental step for him. Like that documenting that he is not Jesus. Right. This is like some John Mayer. <laughs> I'm a recovering douchebag. Shit. <laughs> So, good for Kanye. I mean, an- another guy that you you just hope is doing okay. K, obviously, he's said and done some unbelievably harmful things. And I totally get people who are like, you know what? I'm done with Kanye. Some of the stuff that that guy said is a bridge too far. I don't care what he was going through. You don't say that slavery was a choice. You app. You, ugh. Uh, so I understand if people are like, look, I can't support this guy ever again and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I mean, he's bipolar. I, I, I OP ultimately gets better. So I, I uh, on Google, I, uh, I Googled it and 85% of Google users like this album. 4.5 rating from 210 ratings out of five. It's pretty good. But then again, uh, I feel like whenever I do these Google rating things, Everybody on Google likes everything. Yeah. It's Let's crazy. See. It's like the most unreliable uh, rating source because every time you look up something, it's astronomically high. Uh, what a bunch of fence sitters over at Pitchfork. They did the same thing that, that I did. They gave it a 7.2. I don't like 7.2. G- g- give me a real score. <laughs> You're criticizing Pitchfork for having it a pass s- fail. the same review as you. Yeah, but it's... For agreeing with you. Yeah. They... they they could just be doing that, but I also feel like if you don't like it, just say it, man. I could tell yeah. by that seven point two. <laughs> they don't like it. Just say, just give just it, give be it like pitch a four, fork, man. Just be pitchfork and say that it's a one. I was talking about that Greta Van Fleet lead the other day, thinking about it. The best Greta Van Fleet sounds like they smoked pot exactly once, <laughs> called the cops on themselves, and recorded tried to record Led Zeppelin album before they got there. What a stupid man! If we're if this is gonna be a negative music episode, might as well just lean into it with a little like Greta Van Fleet talk. Those guys absolutely suck. Uh, I'm surprised. I w- so we watched uh, the horror classics last week, and it got me in the mood to watch Scream two and three. Checked them out, rewatched them, saw them back in the day. Have for sure seen Scream a million times, but definitely never went back and watched the sequels. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised that you didn't dip into that. Yeah, no, I... Uh, you should. I should have. Uh, I would have if you had told me that you were going to do it. But, uh, no, I didn't. I have never seen the sequels. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't like to do stuff for, like, the... Hey, I'm watching this movie. Let's let's turn it into content. Like, I like when it's, like, natural. Okay. Uh, y- y- the one thing that you had mentioned was how stacked the cast of Scream 2 was. Cast of Scream 2 is freaking loaded. And uh, I... I tweeted out all the the names but in case you missed it scream 2 has nev uh, campbell courtney cox jada pinkett david smith arquette. omar epps yeah everybody from the first one so nev campbell courtney cox david arquette then jada pinkett smith omar epps uh heather graham 
Uh, Ooh, Lee Schreiber's back? Lee Schreiber, well, he's a main character. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Cotton's a big uh, oh. a big part of... Uh, well, m- main character is a bit of a stretch, but... Uh, Cotton in Scream 2 is a very uh, attention and fame hungry person. He wants to uh, he wants to be on Barbara Walters, and oh, he wants okay. to, he just wants a lot of screen time. And uh, it, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Joshua Damn. Jackson, wow. Uh, okay, so we we Jerry that, O'Connell is a main character. Yeah, I was gonna say we said that uh, Scream was the most '90s thing ever. Yeah. Then they went and added Sarah Michelle Gellar, uh, Jerry Jackson, O'Connell, yeah. and Joshua Jackson, Laurie Metcalf. God damn! And Timothy Oliphant. Uh, Omar Epps. Oh, Tori Spelling. Yeah, yeah. Luke damn. Wilson. It is, and a lot of these these parts are small, but still. Luke like, Wilson. Just completely, completely loaded. Uh, and oh wait, what? That's crazy. On IMDb, it says Matthew Lillard is. Uh, an uncredited guy in the background at a in a party scene. That's awesome. That's kind of cool. Yeah. You know this? I was telling you this before. The working title of Scream was uh, Scary Movie. Yes, I did not know that until you told me. That's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, I like the little nod that Scary Movie then gave it. Or I don't know if Scary Movie came from like the same studio or whatever. But yeah, they were gonna call it Scary Movie, but they were like, uh Will 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 people understand that it's like a tongue in cheek thing or what? So they went with Scream, but I think it's cool that they kept that name going. And then Scream Three is uh, Scream Three is on the set of a movie about the the, the killings. Oh and really? Yeah. Scream Scream Two opens with they've made a movie about Sydney. Okay. That I think she didn't want made, and they still made it. Seems like poor Sydney just like never right. has anything go right for her. Yeah, and she's in college, and she's uh, got a boyfriend, and all these things, and like she's the, still sexually anorexic. She's no, she's she's in a relationship. I, I how horny I, is I believe scream too. How horny is scream too? I would say not very. Oh, uh, also, oh, scream three also has. Uh, why can't I think of her name? Uh, Jenny McCarthy. Ooh, yeah, your your personal friend, my good friend. Yeah, who I mean, she's invited you to invited you to a party. I've which been, is more than you can say for the rest of your for friends. for most people <laughs> yeah. I've met in my life. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jenny McCarthy, super nice. That one time I met her, people, some people were pissed. By the way, at that, that they're Jenny like, McCarthy oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, cool. Anything, anything, anything to like. Anything to to get an interview or do something with a celebrity? Like, who cares that like she's killing people or whatever? And I'm like, Jesus, uh, kind of have a point. Like, <laughs> she, like the, the, she, she's she's pushing a pretty terrible message. Yeah, but, but as, she uh, as, you as that Ellen party, said, so pretty cool. As Ellen <laughs> said, as Ellen said, you have friends and you you don't have to agree with everything that your friends do or or say. So shouts out. Jenny McCarthy, very uh, very fun guest of the two minute talk show. Yeah, dude, go back and watch uh, Scream Two and and Three. They're uh, they're good. They're solid. Uh, okay. Also, Gail Weathers in Scream Three works for Total Entertainment. So that was a cool reference they made to Father John Misty. Yes, they were way ahead of everybody else. Love it. I could see Father John Misty taking being like, "Yo, Just I'm gonna drop a little too. Scream <laughs> Scream reference in here." Uh, Shout out to uh, Creed for right. having just the banger of all banger songs. I always forget this, and whenever I remember it, I scream it from the mountaintops that What If by Creed, which was for Scream 3, and that's what reminded me of it, okay. is like the best song. And what? has one of the best intros. I looked it up the other day. I was like, probably once a year, usually around Halloween, I look up how to play the intro to <laughs> to what if by creed because it's so awesome mark tremani what a guitarist what the fuck that band was stupid and weird but that song rules was it creed the other day that we were like what do you think creed's up to and we like, did that one that. episode scott yeah, yeah, right yeah yeah we were like what yeah. do you think scott Stapp's up to <laughs> Nah, don't listen uh-huh. 
Is the music video? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I remember David the music Arquette's video. in it. No, no, no. Wait, did they skip over the intro? I guess. Okay, they skipped over the guitar intro, but... Small season, feel like I've been drifting down By the worst man who had no ground My tender did but remember dear Then he goes, when your axe is cut, the roots are pretty damn Fork tongues and beard of miles Could drive a man to bleed from his side out Yo, What if you dare? What if... You lie. And that was DJ's what Tiny Desk Concert. I, your vest, what if I for a night? And then the, like the the middle section is like the super cool riff. It's like this song fucking rules, but. Check out the uh, check out Creed. Check Pretty out the beginning <laughs> of that song, Creed. Take it away, Father John Misty. In the suburbs, I I learned to drive. And they told me we'd never survive Grab your mother's keys, we're leaving You always seem so sure That one day we'd fight in in a suburban war You're part of town against mine So we're standing on the opposite shore But by the time the first bombs fell We were already bored We were already, already bored Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling again Kids want to be so hard But in my dreams we're still running and screaming through the yard And all the walls that they built in the seventies finally fall All the houses they built in the seventies finally fall Meant nothing at all, meant nothing at all, it meant nothing Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling and into the night So can you understand Why I want a daughter while I'm still young I want to hold her hand Show her some beauty before all this damage is done And if that's too much to ask If it's too much to ask Then send me a son Under the overpass 
the parking lot We're still waiting It's already passed So move your feet From hot pavement And onto the grass Cause it's already passed It's already, already passed Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling Sometimes I can't believe it I'm moving past the feeling And into the night Still scream.